Welcome to the 8.30 service on Labor Day weekend. I'm going to sit today. I had a little bit of a, a hypoglycemic spell earlier this morning, and so my sugar's dropped. And so uh, to, to stay upright, I'm going to sit down for a while. So uh, I'd rather sit down than go down if I can avoid that. But we're glad you are here uh, this morning. A.J. Law uh, founded the Central India Christian Mission back in 1982. And over these last 42 years, thousands of people have been baptized into Christ. Orphanages and schools have been founded, churches have been planted, and thousands of lives have been changed spiritually. But India is about 80% Hindu, and being a Christian in such an environment can be very challenging. Over the years of A.J. Law's ministry, he has been ridiculed by both Hindus and by politicians who prefer that Christianity not be in their country. Or earlier last month in August, A.J. Law was arrested and imprisoned by some Hindu extremists who want to marginalize and intimidate uh, the religious minorities in India. Now, A.J. has been arrested and he has been jailed before. But he was released on a bond and is currently under house arrest, but he is also currently hiding and waiting for a court hearing, which may occur yet later this week. Uh, Hindu extremists have burned Law's effigy in a public display of hatred and intolerance. Uh, the charge that caused his arrest was a law uh, where the government claims the mission did not provide the proper documentation for abandoned infants that were placed in their children's home back in 2006, 18 years ago. Well, those children have now all been adopted, and they are living very happily with their respective families. But some Hindu politicians have been upset that A.J. Law has been able to make some gains into the government and some strides into the political systems in his area, and that he influences those who are major decision makers. Uh, the hospital the mission operates has been under attack. It provides free health care for those it can with very limited resources. But in stark contrast is the government hospital where in the average week up to 20 women die without any inquiry or accountability regarding, regarding potential negligence uh, to their deaths. Now, while we know there's an increasing intolerance uh, towards Christianity in our own nation, we certainly have not experienced the kind of persecution that A.J. Law and others in some other countries have. Law is battling against a cultural tide flowing against those who want to worship the one and only true and living God. You know, that really is not new. A cultural tide flowing against the one and only true living God and his people has been occurring for centuries. Now, there are times when it's been more intense than others. And as our own nation becomes increasingly more pagan and less tolerant towards Christianity, we're going to begin seeing signs that our faith is not appreciated by some, and they'd prefer that it be eliminated or at the least that it be squelched from the public arena. I want us to see today a bold showdown that occurred on a mountaintop. It was a showdown, a clash between a prophet of God and those who wanted to change the flow of the culture in their direction. The prophet involved is significant, and the place where this showdown occurs is also very uh, pertinent. So we're going to see where the prophet Elijah had a spiritual mountaintop experience, and then notice some truths about our own spiritual mountaintop experiences. So we're in this series we started last week called Mountains, Trees, Valleys, and Seas. Uh, Psalm 36, 6 says, your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. Psalm 121, 1 and 2, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So I want us to see Elijah's mountaintop experience. Now, the story we're going to study today from the Old Testament uh, can be found in 1 Kings chapter 18. 
So I'd encourage you to open your Bibles there or open that up on your phone, on your Bible app to 1 Kings 18. There was an evil king at the time named Ahab. Scripture says of him that Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of the others that came before him. And Ahab attempted to rebuild the city of Jericho that God had allowed to be destroyed, you'll recall, as the Israelites entered the promised land. And anyone who attempted such a feat would have tragedy. Ohiel, one of Ahab's leading advisors, wanted to rebuild Jericho. And then Hiel's son, who was named Segub, he was killed during the process when the gates of the city were being installed. And while this is occurring, the prophet Elijah is being fed by ravens near a brook. A drought was going to occur that lasted three and one half years. And the brook eventually dried up. And God sent Elijah to a widow in Zarephath who had a son that was probably about eight years of age. She had just enough flour and just enough oil in her cabinets for one day's supply of bread and no more. And so when the prophet Elijah arrived at her house, each morning she would get up and she would fix the fresh loaf of bread. And each day there was just enough for that day. The flour and the oil were being replenished by God daily. By the way, when you're dealing with tough, tough circumstances, you want the strength to get through them. God usually does not give you all the resources at once. You might need a physical or emotional energy. Uh, you might need financial security. Uh, you might need a close Christian friend. And God rarely gives those to you all at once, but he provides what you need for that day. Well, the widow's young son died, and now she's experienced grief twice, the loss of her husband and the loss of her son, which meant in that day, the loss of her longtime survival. Because without an adult son to take care of her, there would be no one to provide for her later in her life as she became elderly. And Elijah performs the very first resurrection, and he raises the boy back to life. And so while there's this physical drought in the land, God was starting to give a sign of a spiritual regeneration. And this was miraculous in that a young boy's life was restored, but God was not yet through with his display of power. Notice that Elijah's mountaintop experience began with a confrontation with King Ahab. Now, before he gets to see God's glory in its full power, Elijah is going to walk through a little bit of a bumpy road, and he's going to face off with the most powerful person in the land at the time. And it's found in 1 Kings 18, beginning at verse 16. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? Now notice the king is blaming Elijah for all this trouble in the land. He's calling him, uh, you are the troubler of Israel. That, but you and your father's family, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You've abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now, some of the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezreel's table. Ahab blamed Elijah for the drought. Ahab didn't even realize that it was his own decisions and his own reign as king that was causing the nation to suffer. And this confrontation is about to get very messy. Uh, missionary Jim Elliott prayed, God, I pray, light the idle sticks of my life, and may I burn for you. And that prayer was fulfilled for Elliott when the Aka Indians to whom he ministered in Ecuador killed him and four other missionaries. And his sacrificial spirit was amazing, but more remarkable was the faith of his wife, Elizabeth. And after her husband's death, she picked up herself and her young daughter, and she marched right back to the South American Indians to bring them to God. So she was willing to go where the people had killed her husband, and she was willing to go there to share the gospel. Elijah was in that situation. The time had come for him to march into the enemy's camps and bring them back to God. Now, Jezebel was the queen at the time. This is Ahab's wife. She was more evil than he was. 
But Elijah asked the king to bring 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah to Mount Carmel. And these pagan leaders were regularly being welcomed to the king's table. And so the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah, they prompted and they promoted the worship of idols. Uh, the prophets of Asherah worshipped a goddess named Astarte, and she was known for sexual promiscuity. Asherah poles were set up all around the nation, and often at these locations there would be male and there would be female uh, prostitutes. It'd be kind of like driving by and seeing today the Lion's Den adult bookstore. Uh, we, we had a guy here at church a few years ago. His car broke down, and he coasted into a gravel parking lot off of Route 79, just south of Heath, and he looked up, and he was parked under the sign, the lion's den. He said he called the tow truck company and said, you need to hurry up and get here. <laughs> Baal was the god of storms and the god of life-giving rain. Now, remember, the area had been in a drought for three and one-half years, and Baal was also considered a god of fertility. And Elijah is going to challenge the very gods that should have been providing and protecting the people if these gods were truly valid. Now, all of this is going to occur at Mount Carmel. In this series, Mountains, Trees, Valleys, and Seas, we're talking a little bit about the geography of the Bible. Mount Carmel is located in northern Israel, about 25 miles west of the Sea of Galilee, and the range of mountains where it's found is about 15 miles long, and it's along the southern border of the Jezreel Valley. Uh, the name Carmel means God's garden. It means vineyard. It's a very fertile, it's a very luscious area with plant life and trees. And on that site today uh, stands a monastery built by Carmelite monks as well as a church uh, to commemorate Elijah's victory at this location. And in the church courtyard even stands a statue of Elijah with an upraised sword. But Elijah's mountaintop experience also issues a challenge to the Israelites. As we go on down to verse 20... So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. And if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Now notice the people remained noncommittal in whom they believed. And here is why. Many of them had moved into the camp of idol worship too. Yet even in their own ranks, there was division. Some people followed Asherah, some people followed Baal, some were even half-heartedly following the God of heaven, and the people remained silent, and Elijah is basically going to have to stand alone. And the people didn't respond, which is the easiest thing to do, by the way, in an hour of decision. They just kind of lingered uh, in a neutral zone. And Elijah stood alone. He's vastly outnumbered by 850 prophets, and he's staring into the eyes of idol-worshiping, undecided Israelites. There are probably shrines of the gods of Asherah and the god of Baal are probably all around him. And this challenge is about to begin, and the people and the prophets agreed to the terms of the challenge, which were this, the God who answers by fire, he is God. So two bulls were slaughtered, and they were placed on two altars, one for the prophets of Baal and Asherah, and one for the prophet Elijah. And Elijah told his opponents to prepare the altar minus the fire and see if these gods would send fire down from heaven. Verse 26, then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered. They danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's in deep thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping. He needs to be awakened. So they shouted louder, and they slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom until the blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. These prophets of Asherah and Baal are dancing and singing to their gods. By the way, I know what they were singing. Come on, baby, light my fire. I know that's what they were singing. Going to set the world on fire. This song and dance 
went for about three hours or more before Elijah couldn't be quiet any longer. There was no rain. There's no sign of a cloud in the sky. There is no rumbling thunder. And what Elijah does is to taunt these prophets. One translation says he goads them. And literally means he's provoking them. He's deliberately uh, trying to annoy them. He's trying to stimulate a reaction from these prophets. Hey, your gods are not responding to your pleas. And so Elijah attributes human traits to these deities who are supposed to save the nation from a drought. Uh, can you imagine Elijah standing there going, hey, boys, your God might be thinking right now. Maybe he's on a trip somewhere. Can't answer the phone right now. Uh, he, he must even be asleep. There's, it even says there, your God might be busy. One paraphrase of that, your God might be busy, is your God might be in the restroom. <laughs> but here's what Elijah's doing. Elijah is taking that that's supposed to be deity, and he's making it human. And the challenge from Elijah continues, and he's saying, your God is less than a deity. He's probably not even equal to a human. But wait, wait until you see my God perform. Verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water, pour it on the offering and on the wood. Now the altar to the one and only true God was in shambles. That, by the way, is symbolic of the Israelites who were rejecting God and they had turned to idol worship. And three times, Elijah has the altar drenched. Now, that is a symbol of what Elijah thought God could do. Remember, there is a drought in the land, and to use that much priceless water, Elijah was making a bold statement of faith. I believe my God's going to answer my prayer. I was working a junior high week of church camp back in the 1980s at Howes Mills Christian Camp down near Huntington, West Virginia. And on Thursday night of that week, each family group was to perform a Bible story. And the group I was helping to lead wanted to act out Elijah on Mount Carmel. So we fashioned two altars. We grabbed some meat from the freezers in the cafeteria. We placed that meat on the altars. We dug a trench around the one altar. We even rigged a fishing line from a tall tree where we stationed someone down to the altar with a trench. And then we put rolls of toilet paper doused in kerosene on this fishing line. And at the right time, the person in the tree was to light them and then release them to slide down. And then it would set the altar on fire, which we had doused with kerosene. So we had teenagers who acted like the prophets of Asherah and Baal. They were dancing around and singing around the altars. Now, they didn't act much like prophets. They really acted more like Indians, like did, did this kind of thing around the, the, the supposed altars. But then the time came for the person playing Elijah and the water that was being dumped into the trench, it had some kerosene in it as well. And the time came that the fire from heaven was to descend and the person was to light the toilet paper. But when they lit that toilet paper, you know what I'm saying? Toilet paper, when it lights up, it disintegrates immediately. It didn't even make it down the fishing line. And so our intended flame of a fire on the altar wasn't even a flicker. Now, that's when I was to slyly burst onto the scene, and I was to come from behind where the altar was, and I was to drop some matches on the altar into the kerosene trench, which I did, and it worked. The flames came up. Later that night, I got contacted by the dean for that week, reminding us that students weren't to have matches, and there weren't to be any fire set because the area, guess what, was in a drought, and we shouldn't have been setting a fire. Thankfully, nothing bad happened. Now, look what happens to Elijah, verse 36. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, 
Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I'm your servant. I've done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you are Lord, our God, and that you're turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice. The wood, the stones, the soil also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah's mountaintop experience culminated with rain. Elijah orders that all 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah be slaughtered. And so Elijah had effectively turned the hearts of the people back to God, and he rid the land of these false prophets. Now, some people think, well, that's pretty drastic to slaughter 850 people. But the nation had gone so far away from God that extreme measures were needed. Now, if a doctor told you there was a huge malignant mass in your abdomen and it needed removed, would you only want part of the mass removed or would you want all of it removed? You'd want all of it removed so that other areas not become contaminated with the cancer. That is not extreme. That is essential, and that is wise. And the culmination of this scene on Mount Carmel was that the land which had been in drought for three and one-half years was about to receive a golly washer. We need one of those too. Verse 45. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, the wind rose, A heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Now, Elijah's mountaintop experience witnessed God taking the natural, the fire, and then the rain, turning it into the supernatural. What about us? Elijah had a mountaintop experience. Do we have those? Let me talk a little bit about your mountaintop experiences. While the mountains often represent the strength and the power of God, our hope is not in the mountains themselves. Psalm 46, 1 and 2 says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we'll not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Elijah had a literal mountaintop experience where he witnessed the power of God in a mighty way, and he was able to help redirect the nation of Israel back to its spiritual heritage. So let me give you three quick suggestions on potential spiritual mountaintop experiences in life. Number one, be realistic. Spiritual mountaintop experiences are rare. Be realistic. Spiritual mountaintop experiences are rare. Uh, If you have unrealistic expectations, those can be devastating. Uh, Sports fans suffer from unrealistic expectations. A preacher friend of mine sent some of us an email the other day, and here's what it said. I am familiar with pain and suffering. I've been a lifelong fan of the Cleveland Browns. (laughs) Sports fans suffer from unrealistic expectations. Unrealistic expectations can be devastating in marriage. Uh, sometimes when I'm doing premarital counseling, I get a little bit concerned in a counseling session when a bride-to-be comes in and she says, oh, it is going to be always wonderful. He is everything I have ever dreamed of in life. I know there's not going to be any arguments. I know there's not going to be any disagreements. And she looks over to him and blinks her eyes and starts flirting with him. I just want to throw up. Another bride had different expectations when on her wedding day, the processional hymn started for her to march down the aisle, and she just started thinking the beautiful aisle and the beautiful altar area and the wonderful hymn that was being played, and she just kept looking up towards the groom up the aisle, and she just kept thinking about the aisle and the altar and the hymn, and just kept saying, aisle, altar, hymn, aisle, altar, hymn, aisle, altar, hymn. Unrealistic expectations are dangerous to the Christian too. Some anticipate that when they give their lives to Christ, all their problems are going to get eliminated. And they start with such unrealistic hopes that they're quickly disappointed. Now, I don't want to suggest that times of spiritual highs will not occur because they do. The problem is when you expect them regularly and you're disappointed. Every worship service is not going to have your favorite song. Every sermon will not be the one that moves you. 
what your Christian friend raves about that she learned and how she felt after attending the women's conference doesn't affect you in the least. You open your Bible one morning yesterday and you were so excited that you discovered this particular passage and it really spoke to you. You got up this morning, opened your Bible, read a passage, and it, it seemed silent to you. A spiritual mountaintop experience is when you feel the nearness of God. It is a mountaintop because it extends towards the skies and the heavens. And Elijah stood on Mount Carmel and he heard the people repent when they cried, the Lord, he is God. Here's a second suggestion about mountaintops. Be ready, enjoy the mountaintop experiences when they occur, and realize they may be brief. You think Elijah was shaking in his sandals as he had those servants pour water on the altar? Do you think he was standing there processing thoughts? What happens if this doesn't work? Am I going to be the one sacrificed on the altar? What happens? There'll be a few occasions in your Christian life when you will be on the mountaintop spiritually. It may be when you're baptized into Christ and your sins are cleansed. It might be when you're at a week of church camp, either as a camper or a volunteer, and you feel close to God with all the nature around you, and there are hundreds of other people there at the camp with the same purpose as you. It might be when you make a tough decision in life after a lot of prayer, and after the decision plays out, you suddenly sense a peace that passes all understanding. Uh, when I was a student at church camp, we always close the last night of camp around the campfire singing, Pass It On. Some of you remember that song, it only takes a spark to get a fire going, and soon all those around can warm up to its glowing. That's how it is with God's love once you've experienced it. And then we all went home, and though we had all promised we'd stay in contact with each other till the day we died, we never heard from each other mostly again. Was camp worth it? Was it valuable? Yes. Because for many students, it helps to build a solid foundation of faith for them in the years ahead. But the spark of that week isn't going to glow forever. I was talking to Stacy Schindler this morning, her son Aaron Schindler, who our, was our summer intern this year. He started at Kentucky Christian University a couple of weeks ago, and I texted him this week, and I said, how's it going at KCU? He texted back, it's going great. I've really settled in. I'm loving it here. Now, I was pleased that he's acclimating, but then I thought, you know, he's not had his first midterm exam either, and he's probably not had a major deadline due for a major paper yet. And when that first midterm is, occurs, that first paper is due, will he love it less? Probably not, but guess what? It's going to be more of a reality. And Elijah's spiritual mountaintop was short-lived. While God had displayed himself in fire from heaven, Elijah got to work in cleaning up the land. First, he had the prophets of Asherah and Baal slaughtered, and then he waited for the rain to, camp, to come. Sometimes after a spiritual high. Your patience may get tested, and you have to learn to wait. That's tough. But then Elijah started running. He's probably hyped up emotionally and psychologically. Plus, the Bible says the power of the Lord came upon him, and he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Now, Jezreel is the valley below. Elijah had told King Ahab to get into his chariot and get off the mountain before the rain started so he wouldn't get stuck there, so the wheels of the chariot wouldn't get stuck in the mud. But then it says, Elijah outran King Ahab. Elijah physically outran the chariot. But in the very next chapter, 1 Kings 19, King Ahab tells Queen Jezebel what happened on Mount Carmel, and she puts out a contract on Elijah's life. And the next verse says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Now, he'd just been on a mountaintop. And moments later, he's running for his life. Elijah's name means Yahweh is my God. Whenever you study the life of Elijah, it is overall inspiring, even when he gets depressed after his mountaintop experience, because we can relate to that, I think. But let's be real. Not many parents, and they're going to name their daughter Jezebel. She basically stole Elijah's mountaintop experience. And so here's my final suggestion. Be resilient. Be resilient. Normal living often requires effort on your part and a deep trust in God. You know, even Christians experience the normal difficulties of life. There's illness, there's pain, 
There's various kinds of suffering that can occur. There are people that can make your life miserable. Bringing your children to church does not guarantee their exemption from the use of illegal drugs. Being a Christian does not mean you'll be exempt from a diagnosis of cancer. Just because you tithe does not mean you'll never feel financial pressure. People who drive to church on Sunday morning get into accidents, just like the drunk who drives on Saturday night. Now, is it just me, or is traffic in our area increasing and getting more crazy? I mean, it is just crazy. I mean, where do some people get their licenses? Cracker Jacks? I think... uh, I was heading back from Columbus one time, making a hospital visit, and I was heading east on 70 near Bryce Road, and the person in front of me was driving way under the speed limit, and the traffic was heavy to my left, and finally, I had an opportunity to go to the left and to pass the person, and I knew exactly what I was going to do. I was already getting ready. I was going to give them the stairs I passed by, because this person was holding me up. And so I was going to look over, and I was getting ready to give the stare. And just as I turned my face, as I got ready to pass, I looked, and it was one of our members. I just waved. (laughs) Normal, everyday living requires an effort on your part and often a deep trust in God. Will he get you through another medical test? Will he give you the strength to deal with a relative who is challenging? I like that meme that says, people ask, do I really need Jesus to go to heaven? Brother, you need Jesus to go to Walmart. (laughs) Most of life is not spiritual mountaintop experiences. Now, they occur, and sometimes they can be more frequent than others, and sometimes they can last longer than at other times. But mostly, mostly, life is getting up each morning, Facing the day with whatever challenges it may bring, and asking for God's help along the way. Jay Hewitt was diagnosed with brain cancer. Jay Hewitt is a preacher in Southern California. He chronicles his story in his book, I Am Weak, I Am Strong. His journey of cancer treatments also included his decision to compete in an Ironman triathlon. Hewitt says that while his circumstances urged him to turn away from Jesus, that he learned that in his personal and deepest weakness, Christ's strength is unleashed. He writes, Most often the calling of God doesn't have much to do with what we're doing, but rather has to do with who we're becoming. It isn't so much about what he's doing through you, but rather he's doing in you. The subtitle of that book, by the way, is Building a Resilient Faith for a Resilient Life. And maybe you've not had a spiritual mountaintop before, or it's been a long time, or maybe they've been very infrequent in your life, can I remind you today, that makes you no less of a Christian than someone who claims they have one spiritual mountaintop after another. Most of God's prophets in the Old Testament did not see God's power displayed like Elijah did. Some of them were simply told to preach the truth and to be ready to be criticized and to be ready to be scrutinized. You may long for God to do something through you when in reality, God is patiently working on something in you. And he's making you more and more like his son. Can you trust God when there are no spiritual high moments? Elijah would have another mountaintop experience. Do you recall how Elijah left this world? Elijah and his friend Elisha were walking along a road near Bethel. And at Bethel, there was this school of prophets, which was basically where an older group of prophets would train a new generation of prophets. And a prophet, in its purest meaning, is simply a teacher of Scripture. A prophet does not always mean one who would foretell the future or one who would foresee the future. It means, first and foremost, a teacher of, 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 the, of the Word. Elijah and Elisha kept walking, and their paths hit the Jordan River. And Elijah takes his coat, he rolls it up, he touches the water with it, and the river separates, and the two men walk across on dry ground. And then Elisha asked Elijah for a double portion of his spirit. And Elisha would have witnessed most of what Elijah had experienced, and he wanted to have a mountaintop experience as as well. And as they continued walking, a chariot of fire appeared, and it swooped Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. By the way, second and only time in the Scripture that somebody leaves this world without dying. Enoch, in the book of Genesis, walked so closely with God that God just took him home to heaven one day. 
and Elijah did not physically die. Imagine those in heaven meeting Elijah. How did you get here? Somebody says, well, I died from a fall. Somebody says, oh, I had a terrible accident. I got in the way of some machinery at work. Somebody looks at Elijah and says, how did you get here? Oh, I got here by a chariot. Oh, you got run over by one of those Egyptian chariots? No, I was brought up here by a chariot. Oh, I can see the people going away. Even up here, there's a few crazy people. <laughs> now, we're not told why God chose to take Elijah straight to heaven. But there's still one more spiritual mountaintop for him. He would reappear on another mountain. Jesus took Peter, James, and John to a mountain, and there the Lord was transfigured. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. And then appeared on either side of Jesus, Moses and Elijah. Now, most scholars agree, Moses appeared representing the Old Testament law. Elijah appeared representing the Old Testament prophets. Jesus is bringing them together in their fruition. And the scene is short-lived. But Jesus reminds Peter, James, and John, who are on this mountain with him, that Elijah will be involved in the restored life we're promised in eternity. But what a magnificent life Elijah had with the Lord, especially at his showdown on Mount Carmel. But the greatest showdown of all time wasn't on Mount Carmel. It was at Calvary. It's where the enemy of God was defeated by the sacrifice of God's own son. And God has already won the ultimate showdown for you and me. He's already made it possible that we can show up at the showdown of judgment and we can know our sins are forgiven. My favorite verse of scripture is still 1 John 5, 13. I write these things unto you who believe upon the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you know that today? This morning, Christ can be your Lord and be your Savior. You come today believing in him, believing that he died for your sins to be forgiven, but confessing his name publicly, repenting in your heart and your mind of your sins, being willing to be baptized into him. You come today and you live faithfully. You're not going to live perfectly. You live faithfully for him as best you can each day. And I guarantee you, you may not have many, but you will have some mountaintop experiences with him. You can come today to make that decision when we dismiss after our time of worship and communion. You can meet with me up here near the baptistry area. If you've already been baptized into Christ, you can come and bring your membership today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the hope we have in Jesus. We thank you for who he is in our lives today. And we thank you that we can indeed have a spiritual mountaintop and we can know him closer and closer each day. And God, for the, maybe the Christian here today that really, they maybe have not had what they would call a spiritual mountaintop. Maybe that's just a good reminder for us that someday is just like the next day, the next day, and the next day. And it's our job to be faithful because you're being faithful to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.